Hello, welcome to lecture 2 of module 2. In the previous lecture, we got an overview of very brief overview of circuit quantum electrodynamics and uh, we got introduced to the concept of Cooper pair box. In this lecture today, we learn how to model a Cooper pair box as a two level system and also you will be introduced to the idea of transmission line which is a must learn topic for circuit quantum electrodynamics so let us begin in the last class we started discussing cooper pair box a cooper pair box consists of two superconducting islands placed close to each other typically a cooper pair box has the dimension in micrometer and the gap between the island is in nanometer we learned how to write down the model hamiltonian for a cooper pair box in the last class here the first term refers to uh, charging energy and the second term refers to or it denotes the energy involved in tunneling of cooper pairs from island 1 to island 2 or from island 2 to island 1 uh, qz is the gate charge here and ez is the ez is the josephson energy then the question was how to solve this hamiltonian and mainly how to realize a two level system out of it in the first step we took tunneling as a perturbation and ignored it we simply considered this first term uh, first term of this uh, cpb hamiltonian we wrote the charging part of the hamiltonian in a more convenient form by expressing this charge operator in terms of the number operator while expressing the gate charge in the similar form okay and we wrote down the charging part of the hamiltonian here ec is the charging energy constant ng is the controllable parameter as it is related to the gate voltage or the external electric field that is used to tune the cooper pair box we plotted the charging energy and uh, as a function of the controllable parameter ng and keeping this uh, Cooper pair number of Cooper pair to be fixed we find that in the absence of perturbation various charging energy states uh, cross each other for say NZ lying between minus half to plus half the preferred ground state energy state is N is equal to zero uh, while for NZ lying between say my, minus uh, uh, say plus half okay plus half to plus 3 by 2 the preferred ground state energy corresponds to n is equal to 1 and so on we basically get a set of or array of parabolas for various uh, cooper pair various number of cooper pairs now in the second step we switch on the perturbation that means we consider the second term in the hamiltonian and we must have charging energy should be greater than the josephson energy clearly as we discussed in module one the energy states no longer cross each other they simply turn into avoided crossing as i have depicted this in this picture as you see the energy level no longer cross so we get into this is avoided crossing okay this is what i mean by avoided crossing uh, now next what i will do is that we are going to focus uh, around one of the degeneracy points say for example let us focus around nz is equal to half then the, we'll restrict ourselves to the energy levels n is equal to 0 and n is equal to 1 as you can see when nz is equal to half when perturbation was switched off 
these energy states corresponding to n is equal to 0 and n is equal to 1 uh, cross each other. So if I focus uh, around ng is equal to half, then we are uh, actually uh, confining ourselves to the charged energy state n is equal to 0 and n is equal to 1. And another thing you can see that all the other energies will be far off and their effects will be small. Now near ng is equal to half, we can expand the charging energy 4 ec into n minus nz let us expand it near the uh, this near okay let me write here expand the charging energy near nz is equal to a half if we do that what i mean to say is that let us say nz replace it by half plus some deviation from nz is equal to half so delta nz is the deviation from nz is equal to half then we can write n minus nz square is equal to n minus half minus delta nz whole square now you recall that n this n can be zero or it can be one okay because we are around near n is equal to half so for n is equal to zero we'll get one by four plus delta nz plus delta nz square this is for n is equal to zero and if we take n is equal to one then we'll get one by four minus delta nz plus delta nz square this is for n is equal to one so this positive uh, this positive sign or plus sign refers to the state n is equal to zero or you can remember it just like be, uh, thinking that okay you can as you can see that you are having a positive slope here for n is equal to zero that's why you are having a plus sign for that and for n is equal to one you are having a negative slope uh, from the minus sign okay plus sign refers to n is equal to zero and minus sign refers to n is equal to uh, here uh, n is equal to one okay we are going to neglect this uh, delta ng square term because uh, we'll focus only on the linear term that is the linear curvature around delta uh, ng is equal to half so we will just focus near this region only so around the linear curvature region and then we can write the charging energy ECH is as 4 into EC 1 by 4 plus minus delta NZ let me emphasize once again that plus correspond to n is equal to 0 and minus correspond to n is equal to 1 or I have EC plus minus uh, EC 4 EC into delta NZ now this term is basically a constant it is simply energy offset so we can ignore this uh, constant term as well so if we ignore that then we will have the charging energy as plus minus 4 ec into delta nz recall that delta nz basically is the controllable parameter which you can vary now clearly uh, for uh, n is equal to zero state uh, in the absence of perturbation that correspond to this energy eigenvalue for this energy state would be simply 4 ec delta nz and for n is equal to one state uh, the energy eigenvalue would be minus 4 ec delta nz all right now let us take uh, n z this sketch state as one zero and n is equal to one let me write it as zero one then uh, now let let us switch on the tunneling term and in the presence of the tunneling 
the hamiltonian can be now written like this so we'll have 4 ec delta nz in the basis n is equal to 0 and n is equal to 1 get n is equal to 0 okay let me write it this way this is for this energy corresponds to n is equal to 0 so this term and 4 ec delta nz k1 bra 1 and the josephson tunneling part is going to give rise to this term k0 to 1 and k1 to this all right so therefore immediately we see that uh, we are actually getting a two level system hamiltonian and who is can be expressed in the matrix form by this 2 by 2 matrix we have 4 ec delta nz and here minus e z by 2 minus e z by 2 minus 4 ec delta nz so that's how we uh, obtained a two level system out of a cooper pair box if we focus ourselves near the degeneracy point nz is equal to half now we know very well how to solve this 2 by 2 Hamiltonian the energy eigenvalues we can write easily from our knowledge of module 1 that would be plus minus we will have ez square by 4 plus 16 uh, ec square delta nz square just like in the case of two level atom or two level system that we discussed in module one here also if we plot uh, uh, energy eigenvalue as a function of this controllable parameter delta nz we will get a typical plot like this one uh, so it should remind you about the two level system that we discussed in module one you see uh, when the perturbation is not there this energy levels uh, to these two energy levels cross each other at this point and uh, that is called the degeneracy point nz is equal to half that is delta nz is equal to zero or nz is equal to half this is the degeneracy point and uh, the positive slope refers to the eigenstate for n is equal to 0 and negative slope refers to the uh, eigenstate corresponding to n is equal to 1 state and uh, when the perturbation is switched on they no longer uh, cross this plot i am drawing for near n nz is equal to half okay you just have to remember that so uh, and this energy gap that is is ez by 2 this is also ez by 2 and uh, this particular point correspond to here the state this particular point correspond to the state 1 by root 2 n is equal to 1 minus n is equal to 0 and this one correspond to the state 1 by root 2 n is equal to 1 plus n is equal to 0 all right so i encourage and you to actually work out it in the similar way that we have done it for two level system and then you will uh, get it okay so please do that so we have learned about cooper pair box also known as charge qubit uh, as I said earlier, the typical size of a Cooper pair box is in micrometer range. And these Cooper pair box are fabricated, fabricated using lithographic techniques. In fact, these same lithographic techniques are used for computer chip production the typical material used for cooper pair box is aluminium and you may know that the 
aluminum has a transition temperature in the range of 1 Kelvin so clearly this implies that copper pair box has to be operated at very very low temperature and in typical experiments for better or strong superconductivity uh, scientists or experimentally generally work at the temperature of 20 milli kelvin which is far below than the transition temperature and t is the operating temperature of a cooper pair box okay and because at this temperature superconductivity is very good the typical charging energy uh, is on the order of you remember ec is equal to qe square by 2c so this is typically in the range of 100 micro micro electron volt and if we can we can convert it to temperature as well because you may know that the one electron volt is equivalent to around 10 to the power 4 kelvin so ec in temperature it would be equivalent to around 1 kelvin on the other hand the josephson energy ez okay uh, is in the range of 20 micro electron volt so as you can see here that ec is 100 micro electron volt and ez is 20 micro electron volt so therefore ec is greater than ez and that is needed because as you saw earlier in our analysis that josephson part in the hamiltonian we took it as a perturbation uh, now interestingly you see the energy gap between the two energy levels at this degeneracy point ng is equal to half is ez okay so uh, that is going to be very important so this energy gap is ez now the operating temperature is 20 milli kelvin so the thermal energy corresponding to this operating temperature is in the range of if you put the values there this kb is the boltzmann constant then you will get it to be 2 micro electron volt now this thermal energy is obviously less than this josephson energy that is this gap between these two energy levels so uh, the thermal energy cannot initiate transition between the energy level and that is good because then uh, we can study we can consider this system uh, as a quantum system and thermal energy is not going to play any uh, unwanted role here uh, now we can very easily uh, find out what kind of radiation is needed to couple a copper pair box so what i mean to say is that what kind of electromagnetic radiation one has to uh, irradiate uh, to this uh, copper pair box so obviously this radiation energy say h cross omega has to be equal to this gap that is easy so users have to solve this equation h cross omega is equal to ez you know h cross is a reduced Planck constant and if you ez is uh, already we see that it is 20 micro electron volt so if you put down all the parameters here so omega would turn out to be around 2 pi into 5 gigahertz okay and just by the way 1 gigahertz is equal to 10 to the power 9 hertz now you may know that gigahertz frequency are nothing but microwaves in fact uh, one gigahertz is corresponds to actually 30 centimeter you can convert this frequency into wavelength using this relation lambda is equal to c by nu nu is here 5 gigahertz and c is the speed of light in vacuum that is 3 into 10 to the power 8 meter per second if you put down the numbers there you will get that the 1 gigahertz is equivalent to 
30 centimeter so uh, if we are to couple a copper pair uh, box device or charge qubit device to radiation the radiation must be in in microwave okay so let me write here if we are to couple if we are to couple a cpb a cpb or charge qubit cpb device to radiation radiation the radiation has to be the radiation uh, must be a microwave okay before i go further let me quickly give you some uh, important information about copper pair box so uh, first of all what is the circuit representation of a copper pair box okay let me do it here so is copper pair box or a charge qubit can be depicted by this kind of a circuit i will explain so you have this gate capacitance here and then you have this Josephson junction this uh, big cross denotes Josephson junction this actually represents Josephson junction okay and then you have this gate voltage and then you connect it to the Josephson junction and the island is uh, formed by the superconducting electrode let me show it by this dotted line here by the superconducting electrode between this this is the gate capacitor capacitor and the junction uh, capacitance okay so this is how a uh, copper pair box is represented in a circuit so this is the gate voltage this is the gate voltage and this gate voltage controls the chemical potential of the island and chemical potential is as you know it is related to the number of copper pairs uh, in copper pair box actually the charge distribution charge contribution to the energy dominates over the magnetic flux as we will see later and this is why copper pair box is referred to as charge qubit let me repeat again in copper pair box the charge contribution to the energy dominates over the flux magnetic flux and this is why copper pair box is uh, referred to as charge qubit and we will discuss about other forms of qubit or two level system in circuit qed later on now let us discuss how we can obtain an appropriate microwave cavity because we want strong interaction between the microwave and our two level system for which we need to put the qubit or two level system inside the cavity so what i mean to say is that in order to enhance interaction between a copper pair box or two level system or the ones that we encounter in circuit quantum electrodynamics it is better to put the qubit or the two level system inside a cavity because that will ensure uh, longer interaction time and also it will enable us to have higher intensity of the microwave radiation inside the cavity but before discussing uh, microwave cavity let me remind you about optical cavity to which uh, most of you may be familiar for example i am actually referring to the so called fabry pero cavity you know that the fabry pero cavity consists of just two mirrors separated two fixed mirrors separated by some distance say d okay and one of the mirror is perfectly reflecting and uh, another mirror is partially reflecting say this mirror uh, 
say this mirror is partially reflecting partially reflecting and this one is uh, perfectly reflecting or completely reflecting so say if light is incident on this particular mirror the light of wavelength say lambda it can enter into this cavity then uh, after entering into the cavity it would get reflected from this perfectly uh, reflecting mirror perfectly reflecting mirror and then it will again hit this uh, partially reflecting mirror and it may actually come out okay so that is uh, the idea here but a not all wavelengths can enter in, into this fabric pair of cavity only those wavelength which satisfy this particular condition say the length of the cavity the distance between these two mirrors has to be an integral multiple of the half wavelength which you may know already that means that basically it has to satisfy this condition tw twice into the cavity length into and into lambda and using this you can actually write about the corresponding frequency only certain wavelengths or frequencies or are allowed you can easily work out that the angular frequency if of this type can only be uh, will be able to enter into the cavity so this condition or in terms of frequency you may know this well-known expression so whenever these conditions are satisfied the light of frequency nu or angular frequency omega would be able to enter into the into the cavity just to remind you that omega and wave wavelength angular frequency and wavelength are related by this expression suppose the medium inside the cavity is air so n is equal to or refractive index is equal to here one okay okay so by the way uh, we would require bit of uh, familiarity with febripero cavity while discussing optomechanics in module 3 now uh, for optical radiations for optical radiation in a typical febripero cavity the wavelength is on the order of micrometer and the typical size of the microwave cavity one dimensional microwave cavity is on the order of centimeter in uh, typical experiments people uh, generally uh, shoot neutral atoms let me explain that suppose you have a febripero cavity like this these two meters and then uh, say an optical radiation is inside uh, inside this this is the envelope of the optical field and the wavelength is in the micrometer regime and people what people do so this is in centimeter what people do, uh, does is they uh, throw or shoot neutral atoms into this field okay from any side uh, any direction uh, uh, neutral atoms to the optical cavity and study their interaction with this electromagnetic radiation so this is our electromagnetic radiation so and this is our neutral atom so it is thrown into this uh, radiation there or sometimes atoms are kept inside this cavity and then interaction between the electromagnetic radiation and the atom is studied you may know that in most neutral atoms the usual transition wavelength suppose you consider a two level uh, atom natural atoms i am talking about a two level naturally occurring atom not artificial atom uh, the the trans usual uh, usually the transition wavelength uh, is on the order of uh, optical wavelength or optical frequency say 10 to the power 14 hertz 
so omega is on the order of 10 to the power 14 hertz uh, so okay but uh, so in that case clearly the fabric pair of cavity are suitable resonator for studying strong atom light interactions however for our case for our case we are interested in the wavelength of the order of centimeter because already i discussed about it so microwave when we talk about microwave its wavelength is on the order of centimeter or frequency is in the microwave that is in the range of gigahertz or that is 10 to the power 9 hertz unlike the optical frequency which is 10 to the power 14 or 10 to the power 15 hertz so it will be definitely much more convenient to have a microwave cavity and but uh, that microwave cavity should be on a directly on a chip okay microwave cavity we want a microwave cavity on a chip because as you know we already have our cooper pair box uh, that is embedded in a, a chip as i discussed earlier and uh, we can actually get a microwave cavity by using the so-called transmission line so if we use transmission line we'll be able to get uh, microwave cavity but uh, however actually to get a good idea it would be better for me to first discuss about waveguides for microwave radiation so let me discuss briefly about waveguides and all of us know a typical waveguide is the so-called optical fiber uh, optical fiber but that is for optical radiation and in these optical fibers as you know that an optical fiber is basically made up of glass or silica and it uh, some light can travel inside this optical fiber because of the so-called total internal reflection phenomena loosely speaking okay light is guided inside it and optical fiber is a dielectric but we are going to deal with microwaves and microwaves as you know that they we cannot use glass fibers because microwave would simply would get absorbed uh, inside the uh, optical fiber it, it will not be able to propagate inside an optical fiber and we we know that the microwave frequencies actually can pass through metals so we have to consider metallic waveguide so rather than dielectrics we have to deal with metallic waveguides if we want to transmit our signal or micro using microwave or if we are interested in transmitting microwave signals better use metallic waveguides the simplest uh, metallic uh, waveguide um, we may consider a, a, a simple wire a simple metallic wire okay let us understand uh, how a wave can propagate inside such a wire so we are just considering a single metallic wire let me briefly talk about the physics that means how a metallic wire can support a propagating wave to understand that let us uh, assume let us assume uh, that we have a metallic wire like this and at some instant of time uh, positive charges are created in uh, is a collection of charges are basically created positive charges or negative charges like this are created inside the uh, metallic wire okay by some mechanism so as you can see because of this what is going to happen is that electric field lines would be generated so electric field lines like this would be generated these lines will go from positive charge to the 
negative charge okay positive to negative like this we'll get this fill lines okay so okay we have here plus minus like this i hope you are getting the idea here these electric uh, fields these electric fields uh, would have a tendency to push the charges or charge distribution to spread out and this is because of the repulsion you know like charges repel this negative charges will repel each other positive charges will repel and because of this pushing this charge distribution would spread out as this charges start moving it will result in current and who is in turn will uh, result in magnetic fields okay because of that it will result in magnetic field and just this is for it's not rigorously correct just i'm giving you an idea so magnetic fields are going to be generated because of the generation of this current and as these magnetic fields build up this changing magnetic field will uh, create again electric field which will act against this original motion so a kind of couple dynamics a kind of couple dynamics between between electric and magnetic field okay electric and magnetic fields will occur uh, b fields will occur and this is actually going to result in this is going to resulting in resulting in uh, a wave traveling traveling along the wire so i think you already you actually most of you know how electromagnetic waves get generated right that is basically because of this interplay between the electric field and the magnetic field so this is the same thing here only here is that the wave that is getting generated uh, is a is a microwave so a wave would be result and it will propagate along the wire but the but this kind of actually waveguides are not practical the reason is we are not going to the mathematical analysis i will just tell you the uh, reason why firstly as you can see from this diagram that this electric field extends uh, actually this electric field extends uh, too far so far field would be there electric fields will extend uh, too far and which may affect the other metal pieces that is actually in the chip and this is going to result in dissipation of energies and which is obviously completely uh, avoidable and we don't want that to happen and this is one reason and secondly the other reason is the so-called dispersion uh, what turns out that the speed of the wave is turns out to be dependent on the wavelength of the radiation or it is dependent on the frequency the same thing so therefore uh, this is of course a complete uh, completely detrimental as re as long as we are concerned about transmitting signals okay so therefore the question is what kind of uh, waveguide would be suitable the solution is actually turns out to be very very simple the solution is that instead of two uh, one single wire let us take two wires okay parallel to each other and this is actually going to form the so-called transmission line and that's what now we are going to discuss now if we take two wires instead of one wire the field suppose we create search distribution like this the field will be strong in between these two wires and there would be very very little field outside actually so very 
little feels I should say very little stray feel stray feels outside and moreover uh, it can be shown that the speed of the signal is not going to be dependent on frequency or wavelength it is going to be a constant if you are interested in analysis of this uh, this kind of uh, transmission line uh, you can look at any electrodynamics or electromagnetism book where transmission line is discussed uh, actually even better if you we if we can use coaxial cables say uh, we have a one cylindrical wire inside which is surrounded by a large cylindrical wire outside like this so this is the wire inside small cylindrical wire and the another one is the bigger one and in this case uh, there would be actually no field at all outside in the ideal ideal case only thing is that the field here would be radially outward field should be radially outward for this say, positive charge distribution and uh, no stray fields sorry no stray fields at all outside of course in the ideal case and moreover that the speed of the signal is also going to be constant in fact uh, this three-dimensional version of the coaxial cable transmission line could be realized as a two-dimensional version of a transmission line on a chip surface uh, if we can imagine say a perpendicular a plane perpendicular to this wire suppose it is cutting the coaxial cable okay like this so it is going to cut this coaxial cables here 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 so because of this i hope you are getting the idea because of this we are going to get one inner wire and two outer wires okay and this can be uh, actually realized on a chip surface on a chip surface uh, rather than metal we are going to have superconductors so this is superconductor superconductor this and this is another superconductor these are the two outer outer conductors or outer wire outer conductors and this one you see here this one is the inner conductor this one is the inner conductor and uh, of course we are going to take superconductor in this case because uh, there will be no loss as currents can flow without any resistance this blue colored line uh, shows uh, actually the insulating uh, substrate these are this blue one this blue portions here uh, depicting insulating substrate okay and in fact so this is the 2d version of a coaxial cable transmission line or coaxial cable on a chip surface however we want to pick up a model which contains uh, all the essential features uh, of this system that i have des described here uh, by essential features i mean the followings first of the model that we are going to build up must uh, contain say charge distribution 
SARS distribution because here uh, you see we have a charge distribution uh, like this say here the positive charge negative charge positive charge negative charge some kind of accumulation is there and then here you have negative charge positive charge so like this and in this other conductor here you have this negative positive negative like this so you will have uh, field lines because of that uh, you will have electric field lines on both sides here okay here you will have things like this so first of all charge distribution then the field lines okay and because of it uh, of course we are we are going to have currents so currents so the model that we are going to now build up should contains all these things and all these fissures are already there in our two wire transmission line setup that i uh, discussed where we had these two wires two metallic wire uh, parallel to each other right and here as i discussed earlier we have said this positive surge negative surge accumulation if it happens sup suppose we can create this kind of distribution within these two wires then we are going to have field lines uh, between these two wires and because these charges are going to repel each other like charges and because of all these things then current will uh, flow in the wires and uh, because of this currents changing currents uh, magnetic field would be there because of the changing magnetic fields electric fields would be generated and that's how a wave will be able to propagate through the uh, wire our goal now will be to have a circuit model out of it and this will be basically a discretized version of the problem but with very fine grid so now we are going to discuss the circuit representation of this model circuit representation circuit representation and in fact it will turn out later on you will see that this circuit uh, representation or the circuit model is actually exact uh, in the limit of sufficiently long wavelength or uh, small frequency uh, now having this uh, kind of a model here what we will do next is let us this uh, divide this transmission line this transmission line into a lots of small cells like this so suppose i uh, divide it into various small uh, unit cell or cell size of say length a okay each cell size has length a uh, then you can clearly see that we consider each cell uh, as a as if it is comprising of a of a capacitor for example if you see uh, this cell here okay we can just model it by considering it as a capacitor and i think it is easy to understand right because we have this positive charge here and negative charge there so we can model it as a capacitor similarly for the next cell if you look at it then that is also a capacitor so you will get a, a lot of capacitor out of it and again in order to incorporate uh, so this is capacitance of say capacitor sense c and uh, in order to incorporate the issue of uh, current flowing and current ge generating magnetic fields and time dependent you know magnetic fields generates time dependent electric field and uh, this all these things can be incorporated by uh, introducing or incorporating it through some kind of a inductance say l so that's how we are going to model it so we'll have this is going to be our 
circuit representation of the model now in principle we should have an inductor down here as also but it actually doesn't matter as we can choose an effective value of inductance here to get the same result in fact uh, please note that this inductance is has equal uh, value and so for simplification purpose uh, we are not going to put any l here okay we'll keep it like this uh, you should note that this capacitance and this inductance this inductance and the capacitance are linear in in a that is the cell size and that is easy to understand because if we increase the cell size then the capacitance also increases and accordingly the inductance also increases or if you decrease the cell size then capacitance decreases or the cell uh, inductance also decreases and in fact some of you may uh, guess that in the end we are going to make a tends to zero because uh, thereby we will get very finer grid very fine grid we can achieve uh, doing that uh, now this model already uh, contains this circuit model contains all the essential features that we have discussed so our goal would be to discuss or analyze wave propagation wave propagation uh, wave propagation in the transmission line using this model wave propagation in the transmission line and then do a quantum mechanical treatment quantum mechanical treatment just let me put quantum mechanics and then finally what we are going to do that uh, we are going to say cut this transmission line at say at two points uh, say at two points here and here and because of that uh, we'll have new boundary conditions and the microwave will then reflect back and forth uh, forming standing waves inside the resonator okay so finally we are going to discuss transmission line transmission line resonator transmission line resonator so we will take up this analysis in the next class in this lecture we saw how a cooper pair box can be modeled as a two level system and also we got introduced to the concept of transmission line in the next lecture we will continue with our treatment of transmission line and in fact we will do a uh, quantum mechanical treatment in the next lecture and we'll see how a transmission line can be quantized so see you in the next lecture thank you